planning manager in the, in the community development department with the city of Englewood. And I'd like to welcome everybody on behalf of the city to the citizens planning school for this 2021 uh, session. Uh, as you know, we are scheduled for five weeks, five consecutive Thursdays, the first three of which will be virtual. And then the last two weeks uh, at this point, we will uh, meet in person for some hands-on uh, exercises, as well as a panel discussion for our last meeting with various uh, community officials uh, in the city and uh, hopefully answer some more of your questions that you might have specific topics that we may not cover during the course of the first couple of weeks. And um, I want to just get right into our speaker series for tonight. Uh, we have Joe Minicozzi, uh with us. Uh, Joe is the principal of Urban 3. And prior to creating Urban 3, he served as the executive director for the Asheville Downtown Association. And Joe is an urban planner, imagining new ways to think about and visualize land use, urban design, and economics. Joe founded Urban 3 to explain and visualize market dynamics created by tax and land use policies. Uh, Joe holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Miami and a Master's uh, in Architecture and Urban Design from Harvard University. And in 2017, Joe was recognized as one, as the, one of the 100 most influential urbanists of all time. And before moving to Asheville, North Carolina, he was the primary administrator of the form-based code for the downtown West Palm Beach, Florida. And Joe's cross-training in city planning in the public and private sectors, as well as private sector real estate finance, has allowed him to develop award-winning analytic tools that have garnered national attention in various uh, journals around the country. And Joe is a sought-after lecturer on city planning issues. His work has been featured at the Congress for New Urbanism, the American Planning Association, the International Association of Assessing Officers, and new partners for smart growth conferences as a paradigm shift for thinking about development patterns. So tonight, Joe will give us a, a presentation and after the presentation, we'll have plenty of time for your questions and answers and dialogue. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Joe as well to the Englewood Citizens Planning School. Thanks. Thanks, Wade. And uh, hello, Englewood. Uh, let me go ahead and get my screen shared here. And let me tell you, presenting at an assessor's conference is something to behold. Um, I don't know if y'all hang out with a bunch of assessors, but it's a real blast. Um, anyway, so let's get started here. I'm going to start with a little story about Asheville. Um, I don't know if y'all have been to Asheville, but a lot of, a lot of the, the roots of what happened here in our community is kind of how I got started doing this company, but also what a lot of cities do and go through. I'm actually trained as a designer. Uh, more than anything else, but I'll, I'll actually talk about the root of economics that drive design. But first about Asheville, it's up in the mountains, not big mountains like y'all, but it's there, there, are, there are big mountains. We have the two, two biggest mountains east of the Mississippi uh, in Mount Mitchell and Mount, Mount Pisgah. Um, we're home to bluegrass music, uh, beer. We've, we're 90,000 people. We have 40 breweries. Uh, we drink a lot. And like any quirky little mountain town, we have uh, men dressed as nuns on tall bikes that eat fire. It's your typical little mountain community. But we didn't start this way. This is actually a shot of Asheville from the 1980s. Uh, Asheville was flat on its face. It was the uh, second largest city in North Carolina by the time the depression hit. And then when the depression hit, we thought we had $5 million in the bank. It turned out we had $18,000 in the bank, a little clerical error. The entire city council was indicted and the mayor committed suicide. Uh, that's how Asheville entered the depression. We essentially mothballed our city for 50 years. Um, any, any tried, somebody tried some, anytime somebody tried to fix downtown, um, it was met with resistance. There was like this Greek choir of people uh, that said that won't work here. We're not urban people. We're not the big city people. Uh, we're rural mountain people. We're not Denver. We're not Charleston. We're not New Orleans, whatever. Um, and we effectively had biases like a lot of Americans uh, about what urbanism was and what what, what the needs of a market were. Um, 
little quirk about Asheville. There's a lot of things that the city did. I'll go through some of it. A lot of private investors that did things. Uh, my path is connected to Julian Price. Julian uh, inherited a tremendous sum of money. He put $15 million into a for-profit real estate development company uh, called Public Interest Projects. We actually live in their offices. We, sh we share an office with them. Uh, and I used to work there at Public Interest Projects. So 50% or sorry, 75% of the 15 million would go into fixing buildings. So we went around and bought up old buildings and fixed them up. But we also used 25% of that 15 million to seed businesses. So we'd find like the first vegetarian restaurant. We started that, um, a nightclub, restaurants. It's about having stuff going on on the ground floor that was funky and interesting that, that would actually draw people to be downtown, but also give people a reason to live downtown and be near this stuff. So that's basically the recipe for success. These are some, this is one of our buildings before um, and after. So that building was hiding back behind that screen. It was an old hotel. We turned it into apartments and it was a home run. Um, but the secret sauce of, of public interest projects and one of the things that I used to do at the Downtown Association was constantly talk about what does it mean to have downtown development? What does it mean for our community to have this development? What's the data behind it? And I'll give you a really simple analogy. Um, I tend to look at real estate like a, like a farmer looks at a crop that that farmers are going to look at real estate, the earth is what's the crop yield per acre, the water per acre, the labor per acre. Like what, what are the economics of it that would make somebody till the soil and grow a crop? Well, buildings are the crops of cities. So this is one of the buildings that we rehabbed. It's an old JC Penney's department store, ground floor retail, second floor office, and upper story residential. So we wouldn't have done this project had it not been for the city doing the streetscape project. And it was kind of funny. Some people are like, well, y'all are just subsidized. You know, the city's just putting money in front of your project. It's like, true. Even though the whole world could walk on that sidewalk. And thank you, city, for the garbage can, the bike rack, two benches, and the street tree. That's awesome. Um, you know, that was, what, $30,000 worth of expense in front of our front door. So it's a subsidy. Okay, fine. We took the taxable value of that property from $300,000 to $11 million. So that's a 3,500% increase in taxes on a piece of property that was already sitting there. So do you have, this is community wealth. This isn't, this isn't our money. This is the money for the people that are in that building that are paying taxes to be at that location. So do you have a 401k plan that grows by 3,500%? Like, wouldn't you like that kind of return? Of course. And th th then there were biases of what people would say. They're like, well, Joe, that's, that's that building. That's $11 million. We've got this Walmart over here at 20 million. Okay, fair enough. That Walmart is two times the value of our building but realize it took 34 acres of my community to make that happen. So 34 acres of my farm went away to make that building versus 0.2 acres of our building. So that's not a fair way of looking at it. That's an apples to oranges argument. So rather than apples to apples, or rather than apples to oranges, apples to apples, how much taxes are you making per acre off each project? So we're producing, what is that? hundred times more property taxes to the city and the county. Um, we're also producing double the retail sales. Who would have thought that a furniture store, a tattoo shop, and a beauty salon are producing double the retail sales of a Walmart, but they are. Um, a lot more residents, Walmart doesn't have any, and then also more jobs. So I, I know that I'm blasting through a lot of information pretty quickly, but I'm trying to get you to see the, the apples to apples way of looking at stuff. If you just look at the data, why wouldn't you do a, a downtown building? I was presenting this in uh, Seattle at the National Smart Growth Conference, and, and I said to them, I'm like, look, if you if you could grow a crop in Washington, what would you grow? Weed or marijuana? You're going to grow the pot, right? Same in Colorado. It's like, it's a cash crop. So grow, we understand this with a, with, with a crop yield analogy, understand it with, with urban economics. And, and I want you to realize this isn't complex math that I'm doing here. It's fifth grade division. Um, we already do this when we talk about cars. We don't talk about cars in a miles per tank basis, do we? Could you imagine if I was like, hey, my pickup truck, it's 650 miles per tank. It's the best thing on this page you'd laugh at me. You'd be like, Joe, come on, that's stupid. You know, it's, it's, it's got the biggest tank. Of course, it gets the biggest miles. Efficiency is miles per gallon. And oh, look at that. The numbers just changed and we should all be driving BMW Osetas. I'm making a joke here, but I, I want you to realize like we do this for a $3 commodity to understand efficiency. Do it for land. Do it for your community. Um, it was kind of mind blowing to me as I presented this at the uh, Smart Growth Conference. I actually used this quote from Mark Twain. A person who won't read has no advantage over one who can't read. And I had my hand in the air as I'm presenting this stuff. And I said, who in this room has read your local tax policies? Anyone? 
and not a single person raised their hands. These are people that are in, interested in affordable housing, greenways, uh, carbon neutral buildings, all this stuff. And yet we don't even understand the tax system. We're essentially functionally illiterate about how the taxes drive land development patterns and how they make cities. So tax policy is important because taxes pay for stuff. This is how you run cities. So, so back to Asheville for a second. So our downtown was worth about $100 million if you collected all of the buildings of taxable value uh, back in the day in 1990 when we got started. We weren't the only people that did stuff. There were lots of other folks fixing buildings. But we didn't get a new building in downtown until 2008. So this value here, going from 100 million to 500 million, 550 million, that value was sitting there. It was just empty stories up above the ground floor. It was all these empty buildings. Um, so that value was created on buildings that were already sitting here, if you will. Um, to show you that it's not all love and roses in Asheville, uh, this is Chris Peterson, and these are some of his campaign ads where he was complaining about downtown investment for streetscape projects um, for uh, $26 million. I don't know if y'all can see my cursor, $26 million in streetscape projects and city hall beautification and stuff like that, right? So, so let's do the math on this for a second. Um, if you invest $26 million on a $100 million asset and it grows to 500 million, is investing 26 million and yielding 430 million, is that a good return on investment? Yeah. Why the hell do we listen to Chris? You know, the data is right there that says how the value is and how to grow wealth. That's a really good return on investment. And our downtown has now climbed to about $1.2 billion worth of value in little old Asheville community of 90,000 people. This is a pretty good deal. And, and Chris hasn't stopped, trust me. I, I see Chris a lot and he's got a website now with fire and brimstone. That's my mayor getting hit in the head with a lightning bolt. I asked the mayor, I said, is that a, is that a liquor drink in your hand? And she goes, it should be. You know, people complain about all sorts of stuff. And there are people like Chris who I love him to death as operating with his own set of facts and principles with no data. So that's fine to say stuff, but understand what's going on with your community. And I would argue that it's not really Chris's fault. I think that we've lost this ability to understand the civic goals of what we're living for and creating in cities. This is actually a kid's book that I found in a garage sale called The City, The Town, and The Country. Notice on the spine, it says T, that's teacher's guide, right? This is a book from 1959, and it's a third grade textbook. So in this book, in kindergarten, you learn about your house, first grade, the school, second grade, the neighborhood, third grade, you learn about regional planning. Did y'all do that? You learn about how regional planning works in third grade? For the teacher, when you're going to go talk to your third graders, this is what it said. I, I blew it up right here. But while patterns vary from state to state, counties are responsible for health, education, library, welfare, et cetera. In studying the functions performed by your county, you will no doubt find there is a duplication of services and overlapping of jurisdictions and a lack of coordination between the county and the local communities within it. So as you all move forward with your main street work, with all of your redevelopment, is the county at the table with you all? Because you're all county taxpayers too. And I know a lot of people that don't even bother going to a county commission meeting. It's like, why don't you? You're a county taxpayer. So do we understand how this works? Um, this is one of the lesson plans. It's painfully white. Um, it's also somewhat misogynistic. The girls are shoved out in the hallway for some reason. But you read in blue on the left-hand side, a new factory gets built. There's even more kids that go to school. And so you ask your third graders this question in blue right here. Um, give four good reasons for building a new school. Right? So your third graders look at the picture. It's like one of those Dick and Jane books. You see overcrowding. And so the reason why you would build a new school is so that everybody could have a desk and would be equitable. Um, get maybe get another teacher, you know, so you can split the class in two. But on the right page, follow me here. Mr. Canfield lived next door to the Allens. He didn't want a new school. He says, our taxes are too high now. If we build a new school, we'll need more teachers and everything else to have to pay, to take, to pay the teachers. That's true. So you ask your third graders, why would some people be against paying higher taxes? You know, it's just this is a reasonable conversation. We can't have this conversation anymore. We all basically stick ourselves off in our own little camps and everybody else is evil. We can't see through that we have to work together to build these communities and that there are community needs. They do need more teachers or a better classroom or something. And it's gonna cost more money if you do that. 
So the world isn't free. We have to pay for this stuff. You have to understand how this all works. So just to close with this piece, this is the part that really struck me the hardest. And this is again for the teachers. Remember too, that many children, whether urban and rural um, and regardless of region are tragically limited in their knowledge of the world and their world's larger the space in which they live and operate. I can't tell you how many communities I've been through that we're all tragically limited in how we look at the world. And it's not our fault. This is just the way that people operate in cities. We don't understand the totality of, we know where we work, how we get to school and, and drop their kids off at school, get our groceries. And if there's a disturbance in any of that, all of a sudden it's the mayor's fault. That's not how we need to be talking about cities. We need to understand that a city is essentially a finite boundary of land. And for y'all in Englewood, this is more true because you're landlocked. That land that you have is the land that you have. And that's it. Those acres are critically important in how you, in, how you investigate them and what the data is. Also your role um, in civics is, is that you're a shareholder in that corporation. Actually, if you look up the word incorporate, it says to, to constitute a company, a city or other organization as a legal corporation. So there's very little difference legally between a real estate development company and the city of Asheville, other than the fact that we elect a board of directors for the city of Asheville. So cities are incorporated, your county's incorporated, your state of Denver's incorporated, and so is our country. Joe Biden said this on the Stephen Colbert show in 2016 when he was still vice president, the United States is the largest corporation in the world. And I'll tell you, I'm such a nerd that I looked it up. If you look at the bottom of the slide, there's the US law that lists us as a federal corporation. So, so it's not to say that we're a capitalist corporation. We are incorporated as basically a, a social corporation of how we all live and work together to pay for services. So my city at $14 billion of taxable value is six times the value of Ted Turner. Do you think Ted Turner wakes up every day and just looks at Facebook and then just starts ranting? Of course not. He's looking at data. He's seeing what's going on with the shows and who's watching and all that stuff. Data is critically important to inform how your community grows. And I'm gonna show you one last project that we worked on uh, before I started Urban 3, but this is a mixed use public private venture. Um, it was basically a big surface parking lot that we owned. There were a bunch of hotel developers that were approaching us to buy it. And we have a nightclub on the, on the Southern part of this, of the, this same block. So we knew that people were coming into our nightclub from Atlanta and Charlotte and staying the night. It would have been great if they could just stay on the same block and just walk and not drive. Um, so it wasn't a great property. It was a hot dog joint and a surface parking lot, but we also knew the parking data and what was the need in the area. So we approached the city uh, to do a parking garage with the hotel, and we're going to build housing on the backside. Um, super complicated. It was kind of funny when the attorneys got involved, no, no offense to any attorneys present. Um, they created this really complicated condominium document and then handed it to the elected officials to sort it out. And that really wasn't fair because elected officials aren't attorneys. They're, we have a couple, but the, most people have day jobs. They're doing other things. So I was talking to my boss, I'm like, let's just make it simple. So this is a little cartoon to explain who owns what. So the green stuff is owned by the city. Um, they have a garage in the middle of the building and then they have an easement under our building. We have a building that springs over the top, housing on the backside and the blue stuff is the hotel. So this is what it looks like architecturally. This is, this is what we are here. So um, it was unbelievable to watch this go through the process you think that something where we're wrapping taxes around a public amenity would be seen as a bonus, but this is how we got treated in the independent magazine that we st helped start. They treated us like fat cat developers and we're like, really? You know, you just have to take your lumps and move on because there is a very vocal, ill-informed part of every community. It's okay to have a comment, but if you don't have a solution, or if you're not willing to look at the data, you really shouldn't be rewarded in the, in the community sphere, but that's the reality of America. Just move on. Um, incidentally, one of my friends was a city planner and she said, God, Joe, that moved right along. It only took four years to get the contract signed. I just about had a coronary. I was like, Sasha, um, it's in the downtown master plan right there to build it on our property. We didn't need to do this. It's also part of the city's transit plan. We could have just sold it to the hotel developer. Four years. Do you know how many human beings my wife and I could produce in four years? Five. We could make five people in four years time. That's not fast in our world. We had to lay people off. If, if you engage the development process, realize that a private sector developer has to have cash flow. We have to have buildings operating with rent and all of that. 
in order to pay our, sal our own salaries, our staff, to pay to do the next project, to pay our architects, our attorneys, buildings have to cash flow. All developers aren't evil. We're trying to work things out. So it's just, this is what ends up happening in our community. But putting that aside, I did the state of the downtown address in 2018. I said, here it is. It's almost finished, took a while. Um, but there'll be a third building that sits over the top of this piece right here. We just finished the housing back there. This is what it paid in taxes in 2008. And here's what it paid in taxes in 2018. The same damn property grew by 3000% in taxes. And it's also, this is taxes goes to the community. That's great. We still have a park, parking for the community. I was showing this to my former boss and he's like, you like to make pictures. Why didn't you make that a picture? I'm like, okay, like this, here's 11,500 next to 300,000. So this is the value growth to our community. This goes to our schools, it goes to parks, it goes to greenways, it goes to whatever. I, we don't care. It's our community needs to gain wealth. And the thing that's, that's sad, we could have just sold it to the hotel developer and just walked away. We didn't have to do this, but we wanted our community to get wealth. If we had just sold that building and taken a dollar and put it into downtown Asheville real estate, it would have almost doubled in value. We could have put our money into NASDAQ and quintupled our money. We didn't have to do this, but our community, because we wanted to grow community wealth, harvested a tremendous sum. This is actually, this is what they, what they harvested. That seems like a really good deal to us to grow that much wealth in our community. Go and get another art teacher. We don't care. It's about building our community's wealth and having a win-win situation. Incidentally, that was a 20 year bond to pay for that parking garage. And the city told me that they'll pay it off in year eight. So from year nine to 20, all the, anything anybody pays to go into that garage is going straight into the city's coffers is easy money. It's gravy, it's a cash cow. So we find that we've done this all across the country. We've done analysis, all, all sorts of different cities and just mashing up everybody's data. It's really simple. For every dollar, somebody out in the unincorporated county and single family pays to the county, their brother and sister in the, in the prime city of that same county is paying five times that of their cousin out in the county. Here's the Walmart, here's the mall. That's a two-story building, a three-story building, and a six-story building. So I'm not talking skyscrapers here. Once you start stacking those stories up, you see this disproportionate growth of wealth. And again, I've shown this chart. This is really simple. And it's amazing the pushback people give you. They're just like, well, you're just picking on Walmart. And it's like, come on, dude, do you really need to pick on that? Okay, fine. I presented it at the International Association of Assessing Officers, which makes a planning conference feel like Burning Man. This is like the squarest conference ever. And there was 2000 assessors in the room. And this is the head of Walmart's property tax division. This guy got up and did this amazing presentation about how cheap Walmarts are. Let that wash over you for a second. Now in your cities, y'all get more sales taxes than property taxes, but you still get property taxes and your county gets more of the property taxes. So counties should care even more about this. He was showing how cheap his buildings are. What does that do when you're presenting at assessors? They lower your assessment. So in one meeting, he was getting 3000 assessors to drop his property value. That's brilliant. I was thinking this guy's amazing. Well, my heart was collapsing because I was like, how is he getting away with this? Why does no one care? Because assessors are agnostic. If it's a cheap building, it's a cheap building. So I went up to the microphone and I asked Mr. Terrell, I said, hey, Mr. Terrell, what's, what's the useful life of one of your buildings? How long will they last? And he goes, eh, 15, 20 years. We designed the building to depreciate it as fast as possible. We'll throw the building away and we'll do another one and depreciate it down again. Our buildings are junk, they throw away. All right, don't hate the player, hate the game. If you have a tax system that's based on valuation, there is a perverse incentive to build junk in your community, period. If that's okay with you, go for it, but be aware of that policy, but also be aware of that transaction with Walmart, that their commitment to your corporation is 15, maybe 20 years. That's the life cycle of a cat. You know, we at least mourn the passing of a cat, but sorry, I'm a dog person, just gonna say that. No offense to cat people. I'm just using this as a metaphor so you understand that there's a very limited use of life of the building. Now, now, I'd argue that a lot of people don't see this stuff because of the way that the information is presented, because of the way that we talk about cities. So let me use a different metaphor. If I were to talk with you about your brain and say, I did an MRI of your brain, your brainstem activity is the stuff in blue. 
the green stuff is your creative thought process, right? We, we can show you your creativity and your brainstem functions by visualizing your brain. Is it possible to do an economic MRI of your community? And the answer is yes. So I'll show you how to do this. This is my county. Uh, my county is called Buncombe County. The big gray area up here, this is Mount Mitchell Federal Park right here. The Blue Ridge Parkway comes through town. This is Mount Pisgah, two, two huge parks, non-taxable. So we're just gonna go ahead and gray those out because they don't pay me a penny in property tax. So I don't care about it, right? We're just gonna be crude about it. In green, I have low value. In purple, I have high value. So you've got low value up here. This big purple splotch is um, super high value. That's the Biltmore Estate. That's America's largest house, worth a lot of money, $100 million. Um, but remember, it's a 180,000 square foot house sitting on 8,000 acres of land. So it's like having the biggest gas tank. Of course, it's going to be valuable, right? Anybody have a 180,000 square foot house on this webinar? No. You know, it's a really big house. So rather than total value, let's do value per acre, different map. This is showing you potency. Let me show it to you in 3D. Does anybody want to guess where downtown Asheville might possibly be in this model? So in defense of my cousins that live out in Fairview who think they're paying a lot of taxes, I can show them this model and say, well, go ahead and hate on us. That's cool. Actually, they got our state legislator out in Fairview. They called, they called our, our downtown a cesspool of sin. And we're like, really? Um, how about a thank you card for all the money that we keep on shoveling out into the county? Because the county doesn't pay for a dog park in downtown. The county doesn't fix our sidewalks. So we're just sending all that money out. But also note our cousin of Black Mountain over here. You can see it's a little downtown. Black Mountain has a traditional little main street. The tallest building in Black Mountain is three stories. You can see it popping up off the map. So I would argue that we have to show the information in order to talk about it see what the data is doing and have an informed discussion in a civic way about what you can afford. And again, pushback. We all have biases. Immediately when we showed this, everybody's like, last North Carolina, our state is different. We're different. We're unique. It's like, all right, here's Kansas City, uh, Kansas and Kansas City, uh, Missouri. Can you tell where downtown Kansas City is? How about Manchester, New Hampshire? I want to take one guess where downtown Manchester, New Hampshire is. Bozeman, Montana, anyone? You know, are you seeing a pattern? You see these purple mountains in the center of town. This is Brevard, North Carolina, 7,000 people. You can see it's downtown. So I would argue that the reason, in addition to not seeing this, we keep on asking the wrong questions about how we look at data. Let me give you a, a quick little test. Um, if we can open up the chat, I'm gonna open up my chat. And uh, if y'all could type in, I'm gonna have one simple little question here. Um, do, do, do. do we have chat options? No, I don't, I don't have chat on here. Um, I'll do, you got, y'all can just answer this at home. I'm going to give you five seconds to tell me how many shapes, actually you can hold up your fingers. I can see, I can see some faces. Tell me how many shapes you see in this kid's puzzle. Um, and I'm going to give you five seconds. Ready? Go. Okay, that was five seconds. Anybody? We got we got a we got an eight. We got a eight. Oh, we got ten. Anybody want to go more than ten? You just put your thumb in the air if you want to go more than ten. Anybody want to go less than eight? All right. How many kids were there on the school bus? Anyone? What time was it on the clock? So I just manipulated you. You didn't see that it was ten after ten on the clock. You didn't see the was that five kids on the bus, six kids on the bus. You didn't see that because I didn't ask you that question. Our brains are really, really good at filtering out information. And I just put you on a test. I basically framed your reality by the question I asked you. What I find with cities is that we often go in with predisposed ideas and also a framed question, and we completely miss all the data that's there. So I would argue as you go forward in your process, I'm gonna give you a really simple test with methodology. One is always use apples to apples comparison. That's why we recommend the value per acre method. It's real simple, just make things apples to apples so you can see things in the reality of your function of land. Two is you need to, you need to understand what municipal standards impact land use uh, uh, 
uh, growth. So as I showed you with the property taxation, that's, that's the biggest one, but there are others and I'll go through those in a second. You wanna consider geospatially, or geospatially relevant land use, uh, use this through a data-driven analysis. So uh, you know, if, if, if I'm further out on a pipe, I should be paying more for that pipe than somebody that's closer into the main source of water, let's say, because there's just less infrastructure for that person than out there. That's the reality of economics. And if you choose to give a discount to the person further out there, make sure you're writing that down so everybody is aware of it. Make it real for people. And that's called choice architecture. Choice architecture means that we have choices that we're either making or we're ignoring that are actually choices we could make. Oftentimes when we talk to people about the pipe systems, they just we're, this is the way we always did it, Joe. It's like, well, make it a choice to give that subsidy. And that's okay if you choose to do that. Um, and then finally, you wanna do smaller moves, but more often see how they work and then iterate. Cities are dynamic, they take time. You don't wanna do like big moves all at once. You wanna do little tests and it takes more time and effort, but it's way more rewarding in the long term. Now I've shown you some examples of the productivity from a, a property tax standpoint. And I know y'all are Colorado, you wanna know about retail. So I'll give you a couple of good examples on this one. This is Minneapolis, Minnesota, or Hennepin County. You can see Minneapolis the, on the right-hand side. Uh, Minnesotans are great, they have incredible data. So they shared with us all of their retail tax model. Uh, as my analyst was working on this, here's the Mall of America right there. That's America's largest mall in its retail productivity uh, is popping up on the model, right? I asked my analyst, I'm like, hey, Josh, where's downtown? He's like, oh, it's up over here. So this is downtown's retail production compared to Mall of America. Who would have thought that downtown, which is home to government offices, residential, uh, government buildings, it's also 10 times more retail productive than Mall of America. Who knew? They didn't even know that. And it's just like, why aren't you looking at the data? And, and what I find is that we're not even curious about knowing where the money's made. We just, we just look at a bottom line and we're just seeing the data, but we're not seeing where it's coming from. And again, back to Colorado, this is um, one of the things about your tax system. This is Fort Collins, Larimer County and Weld County. Uh, so we're getting Fort Collins, Loveland, Windsor was our client, and then this is Greeley. This is a really fun model because there's a couple of things. This is the way that y'all get valued, but then you have a quirky tax system with Gallagher in the way that citizens vote. So y'all have voted to tax residential at 7%, and commercial at, at 29%. So commercial properties are paying, what is that, four times more taxes per square foot than residential. That's a function of the policy. But notice what happens in the model. This is your true value. This is how they end up getting taxed. So let's go back and forth here. Notice how the residential properties, which have a lot of latent value in here, right? Let's just, let's just focus on Greeley for a second. You see, you can tell like the suburban sprawl is just all that yellow stuff. Here's their downtown right there. But when we go from this to this, notice how the residential property just drops through the floor. So we're all consumers of the government. And that's fine that we don't want to tax ourselves. That's cool. But be aware of the financial ramifications when you foist the cost of your development of your community onto only a handful of commercial properties. That's the reality of the Colorado property tax system. Just be aware of that. Um, incidentally, what also is cool about this, notice how Fort Collins has a really nice core area downtown, but also the, the, the red areas, the foothills, if you will. And then it's kind of a tighter city. Look at Greeley is just this kind of big westward sprawl going, going, going westward. So you can see that Fort Collins retains much more of its value because of that concentration of density. And because it's more compact, it's gonna be more efficient on its infrastructure rather than stretching itself out. And again, these are community choices. Uh, Durango is another fun one. This is the property tax model. And I don't know if y'all know, I've been to Durango, but basically South Durango is where the mall, the Home Depot and the Walmart's all down here. This is the property tax model. This is the retail tax model. So who would have thought downtown is that much more productive than the retail area? Uh, total productivity, downtown's killing it. And this isn't a huge downtown. This is a community of 26,000 people, um, jobs. Uh, we had a couple of business owners that wanted an apples to apples comparison. Um, Tim and Peter, Peter has the bookstore, uh, Maria's bookshop and Tim, Tim had this coffee shop. They're both quirky people. 
Um, look at all the weird stuff that Tim's selling outside of coffee, He's selling like kitchen equipment. He doesn't care, but they shared their books. And so here's, uh, here's two retail shops on Main Street versus the retail Walmart. This is the property tax production. So who would have thought that those two little shops, what is that, 15 times the property tax production of a Walmart? Um, seven times the retail taxes? Would you have thought that? And then jobs. So when I presented this to the community, I said, well, one of the things we need to go over the corner of the room over there and give Peter and Tim a big hug because they're dropping a lot of money on the community. Um, but let's ask this, this next level of economic questions. These are all retail establishments. Who do you think is paying their retail sector employee more per hour, the blue side or the gray side? Probably the blue side. It might be a nickel or a quarter more an hour, but small businesses tend to pay more to the, to the employees because oftentimes they know the people in the community. Second question, who's hiring the local website designer, the local attorney, the local accountant? Is it gonna be the blue side or the gray side? It's gonna be the blue side. So if we aren't paying attention to the small businesses in our community, we're also cutting off our nose for all these other businesses that are the ecosystem that depends on these businesses. So be aware of that. This Again, this isn't to fault Walmart. Don't hate the player, hate the game. You have to understand the game first. Walmart is operating very smartly and we all just have to learn from that. So, you know, this is all just analysis that's, that, that we could learn from. Another misnomer that I get from a lot of communities is we're doing great without knowing the long-term effects of what they have. Um, I'll give you one of the maybe more uh, dour examples. This is Lancaster, California, awesome community, doing incredible things. They're, they're way out at the edge of Los Angeles, up and over the mountain from Los Angeles, and they're in Los Angeles County right there right at the edge of the Mojave Desert. This is how they developed. So left to their own devices, this is what they did. Um, we did their analysis, there are 166,000 people. Y'all have a, a much more robust downtown than they do. They're not doing so well. They have like one building that's doing all right in downtown. Um, but what's crazy to me is in their growth, they've grown um, 953 lane miles of roads. Now, I don't know what that looks like. So we put it on a map to show them that's like building a road from Los Angeles to Portland. So let me tell you a little dirty secret about roads. They only last 50 years. You have to replace every road every 50 years. It's a liability. But what's crazy about your books, if you talk to your finance officer, every finance officer lists the roads as assets and they're not. So as an elected official, you don't see the true reality of that long-term effect. If we did, we'd be seeing a completely different city. When I talk to finance officers, I say, look, if I have, if I have my computer or a delivery vehicle or a piece of architecture, like a hot dog stand, if I have that stuff in my business, those are assets, right? And they're like, yeah, they're assets. And I said, but I can sell the building, the truck and the computer. Can you pick your roads up and can you sell them? Can Englewood sell their roads to Denver? No. So they're liabilities. They're fixed in your community and you can't do anything with them. You just have to fix them. So here's all the roads that they built is in time in, in Lancaster. And they had, you know, from early 1900s, they didn't really do much until after World War II. After World War II, they just got kind of nutty. And look what they did right here in 1953 when they built all of those lane miles. That's a lot of lane miles in one cycle. Well, guess what? This comes back to haunt their parents' generation in 1983 and when they were hit with that huge capital expense, they went out and built more roads. They annexed more development, which means that they got more roads in that first cycle of this one. So this comes back with the second cycle of rebuild another 50 years later and brings along with it the new stuff. So we stopped them in 2016 and said, what's your build rebuild schedule look like? And, and this, this is it. So that first wave looking backward at 1950, that looks unbelievably dumb. Well, guess what? They weren't the only ones that did this. This was the American system post-World War II. We just went ahead and just let developers just run amok. In fact, we even paid for federal highways to get out to those places for them to do. It was just something we did. We just tested it out, changed the way the cities grew. Well, that was super expensive. No one penciled it out, however. Then we went ahead and doubled down in the 1980s because we were convinced this is what America should look like. Great. Well, guess what? This generation is now paying for that 
So this is the doubling down effect. It's getting bigger and bigger. Now, mind you, I did not add another road to the system and notice how it's capitalizing. This is a pattern that every American city is gonna to have to go through. And this is why we're in sort of a crisis because we're not facing the reality of the infrastructure that we put down. We've gone into this with biases without looking at the data. And in fact, in Lancaster's case, we took their money and flushed it into their system to show them that they can only afford 50% of their roads. Talk to, your, talk to your public works director, talk to your finance officer. Y'all can't afford everything that you got. It's that simple. The way that our financial system is set up, it doesn't pay for itself. This is the American paradigm of hoping that somebody else in the future is going to figure it out. We'll just stick our heads in the sand and just go, I just want to live the way that I want to live. Well, guess what? I want to be six foot tall and have a full head of hair. I think you guys should pay for it. Like what kind of nutty system is that? Yet this is how we run our government. Okay. I understand this is depressing. Um, you probably didn't come to it for this. You want to know the way out of this. So let me try to help. We did a project in Eugene, Oregon. This is their revenue model. You can see their downtown. Um, the University of Oregon is this big gray hole right here. It's non-taxable. And this is a little kind of college towny kind of thing right over here on this side. But the most of their wealth is in the center of the city. This is floating the whole city in a lake. And looking, looking at the revenue above the waterline and below the waterline is a sunk cost for how the city grew. So we just ran a, a bill to everybody for their consumption of roads, pipes, whatever, right? So if, if, if it's a cash flow model, it's a $30 billion taxable value building community with another 40 billion in infrastructure. We can put it on a map and see what's going on. Now we can also see if you net your costs against your revenue, you can see what's net in the black and what is net in the red or subsidized. So this is the top of the model. And we can see what's what's net positive sticking up in black. If you lift this model up like you're looking for a salamander under a rock, you can see where the subsidy is spread across the model. And this is the reality of their cash flow. Notice how the subsidy is kind of spread evenly like an icing across the whole thing. There's some spikes, but for the most part, it's an even spread. And it comes down to what we charge ourselves in buildings. So we call this the Brady Bunch slide, but this is like the ingredients that make up any community and buildings. We have residential, uh, low density, medium density, high density, mixed use, low, medium, high, and commercial, low, medium, and high. These are real buildings in their community, and this is what their sticker prices are. Um, bear in mind, I know politically what's happening when I do this. Uh, the majority of people live in single family detached houses. This is what we all want, but we've also set up a system where we've massively subsidized it. So who wouldn't choose a single family house if you, if you, if you were paying their, their, their fair share, if they're paying full freight instead of this $1,400 a year subsidy um, in Eugene? How would that affect the market dynamics? Or more importantly, why don't we be honest with people and just tell them this is what it costs? You know, let's just, be, let's just be real. Additionally, look at the potency you get out of these other types. So the reaction in Eugene was exactly the way, and they're way left leaning over there. And they're just like, no, we, we all want houses. Like, well, 80%, you can't use 80% of your land use and subsidy. That's just not smart. So thinking about like the city, like a tree ring, there's a term that we use in planning called the transect or like the layers of the city. You start with the core and work your way out. You have to have all of your tree rings have to have nurturing and growth. You need to have a core. You need to have that secondary neighborhoods. You need to balance this stuff out. You can't just have 80% of, of your community as one tree ring. Um, so looking back at the model, definitely do more stuff downtown, make more black spikes in the, in the downtown. But if you notice at the north end of the model, you see this little neighborhood called Crescent Village. That's doing all right. So we recommended for the comp plan going forward to you know, pick four more areas and just grow those up. Do whatever you can, either tax increment, zoning modifications, do anything you can to expedite getting, getting that happening so you can afford to do more single family detached housing, but certainly don't go annex more land because you currently have wasted way too much real estate in your city right now. So this is the reality that American cities are going through. And when you look at your budget, when you talk to your elected officials, when you sit in a meeting and hear that you don't have enough money for a greenway, an art teacher or a dancing traffic cop, it's not that you don't have the money, it's that we've squandered it with a land use pattern that is highly consumptive and in the negative of our, of our bottom line. 
Um, so that's a key thing I'm gonna ask you to look, think about. Also think about incentives. There are incentives that, there's incentives that, that you and I would think are obvious. Like, you know, I show up as a developer, I ask for three extra stories on my building. There's a big public meeting. You know, I get called Satan or whatever, but I, I get the bonus and I get a building built. That is indeed an incentive. But there are incentives baked into the system that drive land use patterns. One, the cheaper the building, the lower the taxes. That's an incentive. But this is just a model of dirt. There's no building. So we go into the computer and turn off the, um, the buildings and just look at the dirt. This is Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, this is the dirt value per acre. See this neighborhood in the upper left up here? Everybody's blue. They're all the same value, 15,000 an acre. If you look over here, this is a mall at 15,000. And when you cross the street, it turns orange. So that doubles in value. It goes from 15,000 to 40,000. Um, I was presenting in Cheyenne in the library in downtown. And I said, why is it that when you cross the street in the same zoning category, does land double in value? And the tax assessor, she raised her hand and just yells out. She goes, no, 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 you don't understand. And I said, what am I missing? She goes, well, this parcel across the street is smaller. And the smaller the parcel, the more valuable the land. And I was like, what? And she goes, yeah, the smaller the parcel, the more value. That's our, that's our standard. And I said, all right, well, this, this fellow's got three miles of infrastructure around his property. And this person down here only has 200 feet. She goes, we don't count the infrastructure as part of the valuation. And at this point, the mayor just starts laughing. He almost spat coffee out of his nose. And I'm like, really? You don't care about infrastructure? She goes, nope, it's not part of our standard. I said, so I can get more infrastructure. And because I just happen to have a larger parcel, you're going to charge me less? And she goes, yeah, that's our standard. So the reason why I was at the assessor's conference was to put this in front of them. And their magazine, I'm not making this up, their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. And I said to them, I said, how is this fair? And how is this equitable? To their credit, they're like, it's not. I'm like, and how is this part of your standards? Like, who, who gave you this standard? Did Moses deliver this to you? Like, where'd this thing come from? By the way, this joke killed them in the assessor's conference. They thought it was hilarious. But where do these things come from? So if you, if you allow me to buy bigger parcels and blow through your real estate and you give me a discount and you're not charging me for that infrastructure, how do you think the market's going to respond? It's going to consume more of your infrastructure. It's going to take more of your wealth. Just be aware of that. And I'll, I'll give you one last example on that. Indianapolis, Indiana. This is their entire county, Marion County. Uh, we were hired to do a transit analysis. So they have two transit lines going through town, bus rapid transit, so they're not even trains. Uh, and we were, we were doing the blue line. So this is a volume of land that goes through the community that's about 10,000 acres of land. When we do these analyses, what we're doing is we're looking for these little hot spots, like this little red patch here, or there's two little purple spikes right there. That's showing us what's going on from a valuation standpoint so we can inform the community that whatever happened there is really, really potent. But um, this is the volume of land inside the transit corridor. People were blind to the fact of what the real opportunity was because they had biases. So that it was actually the city planners were like, we're out of land, we only have 5% vacant land. It's like, okay, fair enough. That's a true statement. But if you just ask, is the dirt more than the building on top of it? So this is, a, this is an economic question of basically the dirt, is, the, the buildings are upside down. There's such junky buildings that the dirt is worth more than the building. That's another 11%. You should definitely work on those. And for the citizens, people are freaked out. <laughs> there wasn't a lot of great infill development in this area. And they were concerned that more junk was gonna get built. Very valid concern. But 48% of the, of the corridor was not going to be touched. And let's just be honest with the citizens, that like at least half, close, is, is, is okay. It's not going to be bothered with. But there's 35% that we need your help with, that the community needs to come up to some level of common agreement that we could split this blue area somewhere. And everything left of that line is on the table for redevelopment. And everything to the right is not. Let's just talk about that. But still, if you look at that line, that's still 4,000 acres. That's a lot of real estate. So we also need to be aware of those are opportunities, but what's going on from a, from a land use perspective? So this is the counties, all the buildings in the county, and these are all the parking lots. So Marion County is about 27% parking lots, which is kind of insane. Or let me show it to you another way. This is the county land area parking, buildings, roads, 
and everything else in the water. Um, the everything else is berms, buffers, backyards, open space, basically. Um, now, when you look at the way that the bills pay, the money is, is, is going through, this is what that looks like. So, so bear in mind, roads and parking are about the same area, right? Same surface area. Look at the value difference. Roads cost them $17.5 billion and parking is only worth 0.5 billion. Here's a simple question. Why isn't parking worth at least what the roads are? We know who's using both of them. They're both used by cars. So when people think that they have, oh, I've got, I need to have plenty of parking. It's like, we've actually designed in the system this discount for surface parking. And you can see it right there. That's a, what is that? It's a $17 billion discount in Indianapolis to cover the cost for parking. So why don't we just tell the citizens that? Because what happens when, because parking's not being paid for, our, our roads aren't being paid for by the parking, the park, the road fund then goes into the, the money that comes out of the buildings and pays for the road. That's not fair. Is that the best use of, of the tax dollars? Just be aware of that. So when people say that we need to have more readily accessed parking, be aware of the cost and consequences. So that's countywide. Let's go into the, the transit corridor. So these are little five minute walk sheds along the transit corridor. Let's drop downtown out for a second. So when you look at the parking in the buildings inside the transit corridor, here's their breakdown. When we saw this, I just about had an aneurysm. I was like, wait, what? The, let's go back to the countywide. Countywide, they have 27% of the county in parking. Inside the bus corridor in the middle of the city, you're looking at 36%. Why would you have more parking in the middle of your city than you do countywide as a percentage of land use? My head exploded. I was like, this is insane. You people are crazy. This is, this is how it works financially. This is, this is Marion of Marion County. There she is. The average citizen in Marion County has 1,200 square feet of buildings, 900 square feet of road, and um, 800 square feet of parking, let's say. That's their data. When this gets built, there's value. So the assessor goes out there with a sticker gun and puts value on the building and puts value on the parking and y'all pick up the tab for the cost of the road. So the roads cost you $22 a square foot. The average building value is 52 bucks. The average parking value is 75 cents. So you're paying 1 70th the per square foot tax on parking than the building. The road's gonna cost you $22 in front of the building and in front of the parking, right? So you're getting 170th the taxes out of that parking for the same frontage of road that the building pays for its frontage of road. So as you drive by the miles of parking, just in your wonderful mind, just watch those dollars fly out the window. I mean, it's just amazing how expensive the, those, part, those roads are. Just for fun, we wanted to show them this, that like, okay, we're gonna take half, 50% of the taxes and put it into a savings account to pay for the road. How long will it take the building to pay off the road versus the parking? So guess what? Roads only last 50 years. That parking's never gonna catch up. This is the consequences of not understanding the economic pro forma of what's happening in cities. And it's amazing, like we don't have money. Well, it's like, yeah, it's like, we used to have great wealth. You go into, go into any old city and you see all this incredible architecture, beautiful public buildings. We used to put our money into that. Now we're just like wasting it on asphalt. And the, the crazy thing is, particularly about Indianapolis, these are the households with no car in their household, one car in their household, two cars in their household, and three cars in their household. So if you look countywide, 50% of their population has one car or less in their community, in their household. Inside the transit corridor, you're looking at 60% have one car or less. So not everyone has a car. Yet when we make decisions, it's always people that have cars that are just like, well, everybody's got a car. All my friends have cars. It's like, really? Look at the data. And they require two parking spaces per residential unit in the bus corridor. I'm like, but why would you require parking when the people clearly don't have the majority, don't have the need? So that's going to add cost to the development, which then everybody has to pay for that cost in their housing prices. And that, the, the crazy thing about Indianapolis, however, they've they got enough roads to go to all the way to Anchorage, which is kind of insane. So we're not talking Manhattan here or Boston or San Francisco, yet they still have that, that lack of, of car use. So just to close, I wanted to like do a couple things with, with y'all. Um, 
And when I kind of surveyed, uh, this is the your kind of core area toward the transit stop is I just colored them in as blocks. Um, it's kind of amazing how big this area is. Here's here's Manhattan at the same scale. So when you think of from Main Street to the transit stop, that's like literally going all the way across the tip of Manhattan. Now maybe Manhattan's too crazy, but but do note the block structures here. Look at look at the scale of the blocks. That's probably easier to see it like this. Look at the scale of the blocks in Manhattan and how small those are. As you go forward with this redevelopment and thinking forward, you need to think about the porosity of these blocks for pedestrians. Big blocks are really difficult to walk around. Um, so think about that in scale. Uh, and I know that Manhattan was probably not a fair example. So I went ahead and grabbed Denver and did the same thing. And this isn't even down the main part of downtown. This is over by the uh, Coors Field um, up to the river. But that's a tremendous amount of opportunity in your community that's just sitting there ready for redevelopment, which is really cool. This is an incredible opportunity, but it's also going to be challenging. We need to have a good model going forward. And again, just as that's an aerial view, this can show you the block structure and how big your blocks are comparatively. And, and they're huge. Um, another example, maybe Denver's not too big or too big. This is Fort Collins, same thing. You know, your area is like two and a half times the size of downtown Fort Collins. It's a lot of area. Um, or to use a smaller example, this is Fort Collins again. Um, and I'll, I'll send this all to you as a PDF so you can look at it. Um, and this is y'all against Durango. Um, you're like two times the size of all downtown, Dur actually two and a half times the size of all downtown Durango. So I just wanted to give you these as food for thought. Um, this, is not gonna be an, it, this is not gonna be a simple path forward. It's gonna be complex. You want to think in a complex way and you want to think about what the, and this is an incredible opportunity uh, to grow forward. So this is it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. It's kind of awesome. Um, so just to close, what I've just kind of shown you is we call it geo accounting. We're going to put your accounting on a map so you see it. But we're taking an attitude like your accountant. Your accountant doesn't care if you buy a boat, right? Your accountant cares if you can afford a boat. So have your community needs, but understand what's going on in your bucket. Are you leaking money in places? Are you, how much surface parking do you have? Is that really necessary? Can you do other things to grow up the wealth of your community? And this also isn't saying, hey, everybody needs to live in a downtown building. That's not, not, not appropriate or fair either. But there is a certain amount in your market that would choose that product if you built it, but it needs that habitat of urbanity around it. Um, and again, I would argue that you got to put this stuff on a map so people can see it, be visual about it. Not everybody wants to look at a spreadsheet. Uh, we like to go out of our way to make the images. You all sat through a lot of images in this show, and I want to thank you for that. Um, and also, finally, I want to recommend Strong Towns and my buddy Chuck Marone, who writes about a lot of these concepts in his work, his books. Um, he just published a new book called Confession of a Transportation of Confessions of a Recovering Engineer. That's awesome. And uh, thanks for letting me do some math with y'all. Thanks. So this is Nancy. Do we have any questions? You can raise your hand or just come off mute. Is that too nerdy for y'all? I'll just I'll add a quick comment. Um, thank you for recommending small towns. I noticed it on the shelf over your right shoulder and I was gonna ask, yeah, if this presentation was aligned with that, actually one of our council members recommended that book to me. It's been in my reading queue. So after listening to this presentation, I'll, I'll bump it up toward the top. Yeah, that's a good book. This is, a, this is my, uh, my favorite section back here, but um, you know, I met Chuck at a conference um, on uh, at Congress for New Urbanism, and I was doing a presentation on all the revenue, and he was doing a presentation on the cost of roads. So it was like, he was doing cost, I was doing revenue. It was kind of like chocolate and peanut butter meeting for the first time, and we're like, hey, we should work together. Um, but that's where you see that model of the sunk costs and the revenues that we did in Eugene. Uh, that was all due to the work that we did with, with Chuck early on uh, in Lafayette, Louisiana. So he, he's, a, he's an amazing guy. Um, Depending on your problem set, uh, Happy City is another good book that I'd recommend. Um, this is a good one. Also, uh, I'm 
this one's a, a very good read. It's a walkable city by Jeff Speck. Um, it's, it's basically written for a mayor. So it's like, you're busy. You want to know how cities operate. And this is a really simple kind of walkthrough. Uh, Chuck writes the same way. I, I can, I can make a list of all of these. If you want to get really fun, um, This is a great book for human psychology. You can see how much I like this book. Um, but when I messed with you guys on the uh, psychological thinking, uh, this guy won a Nobel prize in behavioral economics. Um, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of forewarning. You're gonna be really deeply upset after you read the book because we're, we're kind of crazy as, as a species. Um, and there are psychologists that know our craziness and it's very predictable in how we make bad decisions. We tend to think of ourselves as economic thinking, but we're not. We're just rash, irrational, emotional thinkers. Uh, this is Audrey. I just wanted to say this was not too geeky. Um, I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed this greatly. I am not a, a business owner here. I'm a homeowner, and just outside of the. The main business corridor and um it, it, I, i'm a data geek anyway i guess but um thank you i i i have found this illuminating thanks carson i saw you came off mute yeah i was gonna ask can you expand on what makes the perception of subsidy for single family homes i didn't totally understand where that came from the negative 1500 or whatever it was yeah let me just walk through that uh, let me share a screen. So there, there's a mix of things that cause the subsidy. Um, and this is probably the easiest way to see it. Um, one is there's the value, like as you saw that if you're only taxing 7% of a house and 29% of a commercial property, that's one subsidy, right? You're taxing a house one quarter or you're taxing a commercial Dollar, and you're saying that's right? a specifically Colorado thing? That's specifically Colorado, but every state has some form of that. Okay. In, in Oregon, they have this thing called Measure 50, which is some you know, perverted way of making Prop 13 of Cal that California has. There's a lot of states that once California did a, a restrictor on tax growth, a lot of states followed suit. New York, for y'all, it was the Gallagher and um, I forget the, I think one is say I want to say machine act, but it's something else similar to that. But there's basically a couple of state policies that did it. Um, this is two residential areas in Eugene that are pretty close to downtown. So here's downtown right there. This is one, and then this is the other. And I'll show you like how the subsidy works. Basically, as we were, I'm showing th this is something that we showed the staff in Eugene. And when we showed it to the planner, uh, it was funny, the planner, his name is Will, and, and Will was like, well, the neighborhood on the right's gotta be more expensive because it, look how dense it is. You can see how dense it is in this image and it's probably got more infrastructure. We're like, well, hold on a second, let's measure it. So if you look at the pipes, the pipes are one inch wider in this neighborhood at 9.6 inches versus 8.6 over here. But if you look at the data, you've got double the amount of dwelling units on the right than the left. So you got two times the people on half the length of pipe, right? So when you look at the pipe per capita, you're looking at it's 16 on, on, the, on this one, 16 feet of pipe per capita versus four. So you're four times the length of pipe on the left than the right. So I said to Will, digging a ditch one inch wider is not as expensive as digging it four times longer, right? Um, the engineer was sitting in the room when I was explaining this. And I said, check this out. You're also getting a lot more taxes out of the one on the right than the left. And this is when the engineer pipes up and goes, hey, hang on a second. We don't, charge, we don't, we don't care about taxes because we charge a, uh, we charge a sewerage rate uh, or uh, a sewerage rate for this. So every time you flush your toilet, 
uh, you're, you're paying a per gallon flush rate. And I said, well, so you don't care about taxes? And he goes, no. And I turned, I turned to Will and I said, hey, Will, how do you get paid? And he goes, property taxes. And I turned to the engineer. I said, you don't care about Will. That's just wrong. And Will just kind of slumped his shoulders. And he's like, well, hold on a minute. The engineer's like, hold on a minute. And I said, and you don't care about the parks department. You don't care about the fire department. You don't care about the city attorney. And he's like, I never said that. And I'm like, that's what I'm hearing. You don't care about the tax system. So, all right, as an engineer, what's the replacement cost of the system on the left and the right? It's double the cost. So why do you charge the same per gallon rate when the system is double the cost on the left and the right? That's a subsidy. If you and I were to walk into a, a burger joint and we would both get the same cheeseburger, you're paying five bucks and I'm paying 250, I'm getting a subsidy. They've got a, you know, it's the same burger. So how, how am I getting a cheaper rate? So this is how that, this is, what we did is with that model of showing the, the red and the black, is that we just equalize this so that everybody is paying for their, perf it's that bottom line there that we used to say this is what they should be charging. Or here's another way of looking at it. Um, this is the sewerage basins. Um, so each of these colors is its own trunk system of infrastructure. So it's its own standalone sewer system basically. Um, and again, everybody's paying the same per gallon flush. And when I showed this to the engineer, I said, hold on a second. So these people up here in this district are paying the same per gallon flush as these people down here. And he's like, yeah, everybody pays the same. That's fair. I said, all right. Um, each of these pink boxes is a lift station. So that's a million dollars a piece. And he's like, yeah. And I said, $50,000 a year to clean each one of them a year for the life of those lift stations. And he's like, yeah. And I said, so that's a $20 million infrastructure gift that this neighborhood gets that this neighborhood doesn't get. Why did you give them that subsidy? And he started freaking out. I'm like, I don't, you don't need to freak out. I just need to realize you have biases and that's okay. But now that you have the information, be aware that that subsidy is in the system. If that neighborhood had to pay the $20 million extra infrastructure cost, would they choose to be there? Probably not. Now let's ask the environmental question. Why would you need lift stations? Why would you need to lift your sewerage uphill? Well, it's because it's built in a wetland. They should have never built there in the first place. So not only is it more expensive, you're also fighting mother nature because this is, it should have been left as a wetland. And it's, again, this isn't to shame people. It's just be aware that this is out there, learn and, and make an informed choice going forward. Look for the data and just be honest with each other. And I'm not saying that their staff is incompetent either. They were really sophisticated people, but they've been always operating. And this is the way that we've always done it. Let's just keep going forward with that. It's just, no, that's not going to work anymore. Does that make sense? So when you, when you equalize the stuff into the system, that's where the residential goes, goes south real quick. And it also tends to be further out the infrastructure because people choose to move further out. And there's a lot of road that goes between them and their house. This isn't too depressing for y'all, is it? <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Uh, Brian, I see you. Hi. Um, as a small business or building owner in Inglewood, I wonder how many people in the public actually realize that uh, building owners pay about four times the property tax. Because ours actually, for example, is going up 28% this year, which is the largest increase in 15 years that I've been there. You know, sadly, I would say that not a lot of people know that. And that was one of the reasons why the, the folks in Durango did what they did. Um, and, you know, it was pretty big of them to give them, they gave us their books. And they're like, mm -hmm. no, people need to know this stuff. What was nice that they did is they shared their books together. So you couldn't tell who was the, you know, the numbers. It didn't really matter because they're like a block away from each other. Um, but that was a very civically minded educational device that they did. For their, for their community. And, and it's share that information, you know, talk at the meetings like this about what you're paying. Um, because honestly, everybody only knows their own situation. They don't know what, what you're struggling with and that, you're, and that you're willing to do that so long as there's a good investment return for your community and to, into your business. So 
And, and I tell people with, with our, it, when we did the downtown model for Asheville, it wasn't to shame the county. It was actually, let's go back to that. You know, this, this 3D model isn't to shame the county, it's just to get the county to realize, or the citizens of the county to realize the true potency of downtown. So when they're calling us a cesspool, you know, it's like, come on now. Uh, and seriously, it's just look it up, look up cesspool of sin, and you'll see this whole story about Asheville. Um, and it was just ignorance. So the only way you can fight ignorance is you have to give data for them to see it. And people may still choose to call us a cesspool, but once the county saw this model, uh, the, you know, the county realized they had to defend downtown. They couldn't just let us get, keep on getting beat up. Um, so Thank we're, you. We're, more, we're more than willing to share our wealth. It, you know, it's like not everybody lives downtown. That's cool. But don't kill your golden goose. Are you going to share this um, slide deck with us? Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yes, it'll, it'll, so, it'll probably come as a P, it'll probably come as a PDF. I use Apple's Keynote software, and not a lot of people use that. Um, so I'll I'll send it as a PDF file. So he'll Thank send you. that to uh, the community development staff, Wade and myself, and we will send that out to all of the students, all of you. And then, since tonight is being recording recorded, we'll also be uploading the recording to our Inglewood Engaged Code Next page, but I'll send you that link too, to everyone if you want to rewatch any portion of it. Does that work for everyone? Do we have this type of data available for Inglewood? Have we gone to this depth of analysis? Is that a question for me? I don't, I don't, I, I, <laughs> That's probably the Inglewood staff. Okay. <laughs> We have not gone to this level of, of data gathering and presentation. Um, uh, we could do so um, if, if that's the desire of, of the city council or city manager and um, present that information at a further date. It would, it would likely require consulting with, with an outside party to, to help us do the research and gather the information, but it's always something that could be done. What were the, um, so when you were saying that the, somebody was calling you the cesspool and I assume they were pushing policies, what, what were, what was it that they were pushing for? There, there's a, you know, when you have two voters out in the county for every one voter in the city, um, we'll, we'll never win politically. You know, there's two of them, there's one of us. Um, and I don't know if you if you pay attention to East Coast politics back then, um, our whole state uh, was gerrymandered to such a crazy extent that it, you know our, our politics just got batty. Um, the hardcore um, Southern conservatives took over and just went on this war with every municipality. Um, Asheville had its ability to annex land struck. Uh, they took our water system. They took our airport. Um, we had a sue to save the water system. We gave up on the airport. Um, and it was just this really weird removing of assets of, of municipal wealth and then liquidating them into the county. So we had all these people in the county that had very limited water resources. So they came after our water, which would be, I mean, you all know water wars in, in, in the Rockies. Um, so that, that kind of what was what started. So rather than talk about that, it turned into this brandishing of those two people out in the county are so much more important than the city dwellers. So the, the, the politicians just kind of dusted that up of like, you're worthy because they knew the votes. They knew that they were going to win, um, but they were trying to find a way to coddle that po political animosity so that they could legitimately steal our water. Um, so that's kind of what the backstory behind it. Um, and so rather than, you know, it's, it's ignorance, really. And the politicians did a very nefarious thing by basically inflaming the ignorance and just coaching people up into being vile and angry with each other. 
Um, you know, this, we've kind of lived with that uh, since then. It's kind of become a national thing now to do something like that. But back then in 2010, that was new. Um, so, you know, our attitude was like, let's just be honest and open and offer information in, in a way that people can all get on the same page and see it all on a map. You know, when you see, I, I flew through a lot of information. I know I did. That's the way I present. Um, you all sat through uh, 169 slides in 50 minutes. Did it feel like 169 slides? It's, it's because I'm moving the, this information. And what I, what I know about humans at the other end of this video conference is, is that everybody's pretty, pretty darn smart and you can follow the information if it's a good narrative and a good story. Um, and your eyes are so quick at it picking up information. I don't have to dwell on things. Um, so that's why we do these maps is to show the stuff is that everybody can get it once they see it. And luckily when our community saw it, the, the, the rabble of the selfish got watered down um, once the general community was like, yeah, we should be protecting downtown. They, they kind of saw it in that model. So it was, that's kind of the backstory behind the why there. Does thank that make you. sense? Yeah, thank you. Joe, I'm just curious if you've worked with any of your clients and, and been able to affect public perception based on these models before. Uh, so much of what you're saying resonates um, with what we're seeing here. I actually work for the county and, and some of these discussions are just, you know, we have these daily, but no matter how we try to splice and dice and visualize the data, that knowledge gap is seemingly so wide that I'm, I always worry we're never gonna be able to get over it. Have, do you have any examples of places where it has worked um, with a little bit of education? Yeah, I mean, one of the things is, um, you know, it depends. I, I used to be, I used to work in government as a, as a city staffer. And sometimes it's the messenger, you know, it's like, oh, we don't need to listen to Joe. He's, we see him at lunch, you know, it's like, okay, so I'm not an expert. Um, so there's, I do have the benefit of being like the outside guy. So y'all are going to trust me in a different way than if you lived here in Asheville. So I take advantage of that, knowing that I'm, I'm the guy brought in from outside, but I don't just like roll in and, and tell you about yourself. I started with Asheville. Um, because I had to build trust with you all and tell you a story about Asheville. But as you listen to the Asheville story, you're hearing a lot of familiar stuff in your community. Um, so that's kind of letting you know that I know what you guys are going through. Um, but the narrative of how you tell stories and information, you have to make it accessible for people. And that's why I try with five different ways to show the same thing in, in the narrative of, of my talk. So some people like maps, some people like the, 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 the three-dimensional pictures, or some people like pie charts. I don't know. I don't know what you all like, but I have to try every way to give information so that you're making that connection between the core of a community and its value and potency. Um, and, and to be honest with you, you know, there's a lot of people that just don't want information. You know, it's, they're just NIMBYs um, or anti-civic. They don't have solutions. That's all they can say is no. And I think, I, I think we need to honor and respect those folks. They're citizens just like everybody else. Chris, the guy I, I kind of slam in, in my show, um, Chris is one of these NIMBYs. He's never got a solution. He's ridiculously uh, Appalachian mountain conservative, which is a different kind of conservative. He's a very generous man, very nice man, but he hates spending money, period. And he was a city councilor. And it was just like, dude, you just honestly don't like that is this religious belief in not spending money. And which is like, well, that works for some people, but I couldn't pay for my college out of pocket. I had to take out student loans. I had to work my way through college. I couldn't just pay cash to buy a house. I got a mortgage, you know? It's like there's a there's a need for debt sometimes. But in Appalachia, there are people that just are ridiculously debt resistant. Um, and so it becomes a religion to them. And I would argue that, yeah, you don't want to be silly with money, but sometimes you need to buy a house. Um, but I didn't, I didn't go out and buy a $5 million house. You know, I didn't over leverage myself. So anyway, it's just, it needs the conversation and it's okay to have the debate, but there are people that just, they just have a religious way of looking at things and it can't be 
it can't be affected with a fact. And I think as, a, as something that works in government, that's the sad reality is that I, I was, I always believed that like, I can reach everybody with data. And the reality is there's some people that just, they choose their own ticket and I'm not, I can't affect them. But in Rancho Cucamonga, sorry, I got off topic. In Rancho Cucamonga, we did their model and uh, the assistant city manager, everybody finally figured out the value per acre is a metric. And he called me up uh, and this wasn't even, it was part of a general plan thing. Um, and he's like, you know, Joe, we had this steel plant that is like a steel mill kind of thing. And he, he said, they, they gave us $600,000 a year in retail sales taxes. It was a really big retail sales tax generator. But then after your show, we went and did a per acre analysis on the property taxes and the retail taxes. And it turns out these small little manufacturers that were giving us these smaller checks are 15 times more potent on a per acre basis. So we just kind of gave up on the big steel mill and told them to take a hike. And like actually the steel mill came in and they're like, hey, how about that tax subsidy that we always get, the property tax subsidy, can we get that again? And the city manager is like, why don't you go to Arizona? And it was like, wow, that's cold. I can't, but that's like, it was, it was like that. Oftentimes we don't know what's gonna be effective um, in the community in, in uh, South Bend, Indiana, uh, Mayor Pete, his team was our client. And they were tearing houses down all over the place because they're losing people. And we showed them what the economic consequences are. Of So if, if you've got taxes, you've got property tax for the dirt and property tax for the building, right? So there's two forms of taxes. If you look at your tax bill, the dirt value is way less than the building value. So most of your money is coming out of the building. Well, if you take the building down, you've got very little taxes. So they're actually losing $2.5 million a year in paying for streets, sidewalks, plows, and not having a building. And we told them, we're like, why don't you just give the houses to college students for a buck, you know? And just say that they have to live there for 10 years or something. You've got all these non Notre Dame kids, keep them in town. And so they, they changed their way of looking at housing teardowns. So it's, it's you know, it's not, it's not planner stuff that we're doing. So it's kind of, a, there's a lot of gray area in, in what people do to change. But you can't unsee the data once you see it. Kind of crazy. I'm curious if there's any way that you incorporate into like because everything you've shown, like data wise, makes sense when you're looking at it from a perspective of tax. But what about like how do you calculate or incorporate quality of life, less the benefits of less density, of less traffic, of ease of parking, of you know, a lot of people see those things as valuable and important. And if the the you know the pipes are already there, there's not, I don't at least, you know, I certainly don't know details on how much pipes have to be replaced um, and what kind of taxes go into that. But just, I wonder like how you address that type of stuff, because I know that there's a lot of people that care about, you know, I bought a house in a place that's not very dense. I like that. I like that. I never have trouble parking on the street. I like that. I don't get stuck in traffic going around town. And when you increase density, those things change. I think we should probably just start killing people. You know, it'd be, it'd be less dense that way. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's just pay your fair share. You know, if you want to live that lifestyle, awesome. The community shouldn't carry you around on a pillow or let's go ahead and like, one of the reasons why we ran that number for Eugene was like, let's just make sure that everybody is aware of this. And if you can afford it, awesome. But for that citizen that wants that quality of life stuff, well, one is like, how do you measure that? What's your quality of life versus my quality of life? You know, I'd like to be able to ride my bicycle to work without getting killed. That would increase my quality of life. So why do we have to have this like 55 mile an hour road for me to cross when I try to get to work? You know, why, why should my transportation modality be any less inferior or any, 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 any less uh, safe than somebody in a car? Um, and it's just like, let's just talk about that. What is, what would it cost for a bike lane? And I'm sorry, you're going to take two more minutes extra to go through town because you're going to have to go to slower speed. So you don't kill me. Um, you know, it's like, those are trade-offs. So I, I don't, I'm not adverse to that conversation. It's just that often that conversation comes with no information. It's just what I feel like. And it's just like, you do realize there's other people in the room, right? We all have feelings. 
So it's it's if if you can put the numbers on a map, if you can, or on, on a, in a data form that I can map, great. Now that's why actually this is a good one. They actually get, this is a bad. I don't I don't necessarily agree with the title, but this is a great one on on quantitative data for happiness factors and social well being. Um, but it, it's I think that we just need to raise the level of conversation past that. But it, yeah, you're right. I, I have heard that a million times. There's a great quote from Michael Bloomberg um, when he was mayor that if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So how do I measure your quality, quality of life so I can manage it? What is it? Um, and if the community is okay with you having that cheap parking, okay. I'm not gonna, I don't care if a community chooses to buy pink elephants and put them all over every street. That's your community, knock yourself out. Whether or not you can afford those pink elephants, that's a whole other question. And it might make you happy. This isn't one of those, uh, we're not treading into the uh, gummy territory, are we, with uh, happiness? Just kidding. It's a Colorado joke. So we're at the end of our 90 minutes. I want to take the opportunity to thank Joe. Joe, you've given us a lot to think about. Outstanding presentation. And I just want to uh, reiterate, as we learned tonight, about some new ways maybe to think about how cities operate and how we pay for things and, and so forth. I want to just say that we're going to build on some of this as we go forward in the next few weeks. We're going to be talking about a neighborhood character and preservation and affordable housing and, and development. So um, the future sessions after tonight will build on some of these concepts and you know everybody's um, perspective and, and contributions of the conversation are going to be most valuable for everybody to kind of learn from each other and keep the dialogue going and continue to uh, learn, discuss how cities operate and how Englewood operates. And as Nancy mentioned, um, you know, we will send you the slides as well as the presentation will be posted online um, in the coming days. So uh, look for that. Uh, you can always at that point watch and rewatch again and, and learn uh, many of the points that Joe went over with us tonight. So again, thank you, Joe, and thank you, uh, everybody in uh, the school tonight. And we look forward to seeing you at 6 p.m. Uh, next week when we'll talk about neighborhood character as well as some some development um, um, uh, discussion that's happening and has happened here in Englewood. So we look forward to seeing you all then and uh, take care. Thank you. Thanks y'all. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, Joan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.